Hello, I'm Jim Halfpenny, and I welcome you to A Gathering of Naturalists. A Gathering is hosted by Naturalist World, an ecological education company located at the north entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Our company sponsors educational programs and research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We also host this free lecture series, A Gathering of Naturalists, which highlights the knowledge and expertise of those who live, study, and love the ecosystem. Now, please join us for our program. Okay, uh, for tonight, welcome to CSI Yellowstone National Park for NSIC investigators. Uh, Sue Ware, Jim Halfpenny, Diane Carson. Well, now, wait a minute. CSI Yellowstone, no, 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 scratch that. You know me, this is TSI Yellowstone. That's track scene investigation. And um, what we're gonna do tonight is dedicate this to Diane Carson. Diane Carson is a flatline consulting, and Diane um, was very instrumental in much of the work that we're doing. She fastidiously labeled every bone, and you get a wolf carcass with skull. There's about 300 bones there that she had to label and put accession numbers on, and uh, she did a lot of the data entry. Regretfully, cancer took Diane from us. So this is dedicated to Diane Carson tonight. Now, what we're going to look at, some stories from the bones, the hazards of being a wolf. Sue Ware instigated this project. Sue works down at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I'll come back to some of Sue's accomplishments here in a few minutes. But let's take a look tonight then at stories from the bones. I want you to look at a continuum. That's going to be this blue line coming across here. And this is a continuum dealing with the wolves. And we're going to put Yellowstone at one end. Yellowstone is very special. We have bones, we have skulls, we have teeth, but we also have observations on uh, all these animals. From can't see in the morning to can't see at night, 365 days a year, there's a dedicated cadre of people out there observing the bears and observing the wolves in particular for this talk and uh, making notes and sharing the notes over the internet. Additionally, we have genealogy that we've composed uh, using the observations of people in the field and genetics. The genetics in and of itself is important because the genetics allow us to uh, look at bloodlines. They allow us to look at diseases, inherited diseases and things like that. And we've got 200 or so skulls of these animals. And if you look at the ones from the Heritage Museum, in the Draper Museum, we've got around 60, maybe 70 full skeletons of the animals. Yellowstone is the best collection of bones and knowledge in the history of the planet Earth. Nothing can compete. But as we go across our line there, we can go to Isle Royal. Yeah, they've got some bones and skulls and stuff like that. Observations, but observations nowhere near as complete as Yellowstone. And of course, with that small captive population, there is uh, some genealogical information. So N, that means the sample size. Uh, I don't know their exact number, but they've got quite a few animals there. And as we go a little bit farther, <clears throat> at the University of Indiana, there's a collection of bones and skulls from a batch of Canadian wolves, lots of bones, but no observations on those animals originally. We don't know genealogy, we don't know genetics, and there's a lot fewer of those animals there. So as we're coming across our spectrum here, the level of material to work and knowledge is going down. We can go to scattered museums across North America, the United States and Canada, we can find bones, few complete skeletons, few observations on those animals, no genealogy. Uh, so the level of knowledge is much more constrained uh, once you get outside Yellowstone. And then we go out to the La Brea Tar Pits, downtown in California, Hollywood, and they've got lots of bones there, to say the least. However, no observations. There wasn't anybody there to look at them. We don't have genealogy, and we don't really have genetic on it. Uh, they've got somewhere well over 2,000 
uh, carcasses, and that number keeps climbing every time they dig a little bit more in corn pits. Now, Dr. Sue Ware, who instigated this project, Sue, her PhD thesis was the pathology of the dire wolves of Rancho La Brea tar pits. Now, everything on the right half here, they're gray wolves, but I used a different term for the La Brea wolves. They're the dire wolves, and they went extinct around the end of the last ice age. Uh, perhaps what we can learn from living wolves, the gray wolves, will help us interpret what goes on with the dire wolves. And some of the dire wolf knowledge will be helpful uh, when we look at the gray wolves, for example, in the dire wolves, we find a lot of cancer in the bones. Um, but we've got a spectrum of knowledge with the two best known specimens at each end. But the intriguing thing is they're different species, all, all by, be it closely related. Uh, one of the things for that gray wolf is a complete pathology, thanks to Sue Ware working on him, and of course her PhD thesis, the pathology of the dire wolf on the other end. So we can compare between uh, the problems in the bones, trauma, genetics, uh, et cetera, wear and tear between a living wolf and a dead wolf. It's quite a spectrum to be able to study. Um, and Sue has been instrumental in preparing this in cleaning up specimens, getting specimens ready. The collection will go long beyond us as other people find more and more questions to ask from the, quest, uh, from the collection, things that we've never even dreamed of at this point. So what do bones tell us? A uh, nice x-ray of a wolf skull right there and a lower jaw down below it. But from bones, we can get a um, pretty good idea of the age, sometimes the sex. We can look at the bones and the skulls for diseases, pathology that might be going on. We can pick up on diet and nutrition. We can pick up on injuries or abnormal anomalies, abnormal bone growth. Uh, we might be able to learn something about a predator-prey interaction and cause of death. Uh, the bones also operate, offer us a way to compare with other populations along that spectrum that I told you about. Skulls and bones injuries is one of the things we look at a lot. Where does that injury occur? How severe is that image, injury? What damage is caused? You know, one of the neat things about the Yellowstone population is the fact when we look at a skeleton and we find broken ribs, that wolf is probably known. In fact, some of the cadre of observers out there can tell us, yep, July 17th, that wolf got kicked by an elk. So it's really a incredible knowledge base to work with. And we're getting up to a sample size that's large enough to say, hey, are we seeing something genetic in here? Is this a abnormality that is passed down from wolf to wolf to wolf? Well, you know, we take a look at the skulls, they're very important to us, but what about the rest of the skeleton? Right now in the collections, there's around 200 skulls between the Yellowstone Heritage Center and the Draper Museum over at Cody, but only about 60 to 70 skeletons. But you see here some broken ribs and infected foots, bite marks on the uh, jaws. There's lots of things we can pick up if we've got a bone to look at. Lots of things we can study if we've got a bone to look at. Well, how do we go about that? Let me introduce you to my toolbox. You see my toolbox, I've got a nice set of little screwdrivers, adjustable screwdrivers, hammers, and all sorts of tools in there. So let me introduce you to nature's toolbox. Here is the box, which is a skull and skeleton. And in it, there's a selection of tools. There's incisors, that's a tool. Canine, that's a tool. Premolars, that's a tool. Molars, that's a tool. So just as I have a toolbox, so does nature. And that toolbox is encompassed in the whole wolf, coyote, bear, whatever we happen to be looking at. It's tools and it's container. But guess what, folks? Over time, I loaned out tools. Tools got broke. My toolbox started looking pretty darn sad, really. And you know what? In nature, it occurs that way, too. Uh, what happens when these tools get broken off, like those canines? And here's a missing molar, a missing premolar, and no canine up there. When the tools start missing, breaking, well, bottom line is you're going to have a poor job, a faulty job. 
So what I'd like to do is take a look at some of the wolves. Now, number eight was a very famous wolf. We brought it from Canada in 1995 in the Crystal Creek pack. And uh, in the spring, after high water uh, dropped down, we found this animal, a number eight, washed up underneath a log, quite dead in 2002. I want to take a look at his skull and see what it says, though. What is the skull and the tools going to tell us? Well, if we take a look here, one of the first things that might catch your eye, upper broken canine. And there's the root canal, that opening so big that I could stick my little finger right up the opening. Down below here, we're missing a canine. It's not there. This is back here on the back part of the skull is what a normal skull should look at. Good, shiny, smooth bone. But up here, you see all sorts of little holes in it. Uh, those holes are infection. Um, and we have a fancy word for that, osteomyelitis. Now down here, we have what we call remolding or regrowth. That canine's been missing long enough that the bone's actually grown back, but here's a major abscess on this side. And if we flick this over to the other side, this canine looks pretty good. It's showing wear and tear of the ages on the tip, but we're missing some incisors here. And uh, here's some more osteomyelitis. Let's zoom in and look at that amount of affection in the jaw. If you'd have opened up number eight's mouth uh, towards the end of its life, it would have stunk to high heaven. That's gingivitis, folks, gone wild. So, hey, remember, brush your teeth, okay? Take care of your gingivitis there. Well, what we've got going on is number eight was riddled with facial infection. His teeth were loose. Often when we pick up, most of the time we pick up a skull, Teeth will stay in because of the natural protein glues, but these teeth fell out. Number eight's teeth were broken. They showed trauma. In its life, it had gone through a lot of trauma. Well, broken tools, that's not good, but he was still an alpha male about a month before the um, uh, animal was found dead, washed up. We discovered that it, or we watched it, help bring down an elk. Uh, so broken tools, so that's going to mean a faulty job. Now let's switch to another animal. This is number 34, a male, uh, that nice thick male uh, chest from the spine down to the bottom of the Chief Joseph pack, who brought from Canada in 1996. And at the time, he was a rather small male, uh, 106 pounds. And we're going to take a look at his tools. What do his tools tell us? Well, if you look here, you'll see that there is uh, quite a bit of difference from number eight. This canine is worn down and there's a little uh, root canal hole. This canine has a break. Now, skulls and teeth dry out. The longer you have them, uh, the more they'll dry out and fracture. This fracture is what we would call a post-mortem. It happened after death. But if you look at all the incisors, they're quite worn down, root canal showing. This is all in the skull. If we go to the lower jaw, canine very worn down with uh, root canal showing, incisors worn down, canine worn down again with the root canal showing. This is a different story. This is telling us a uh, wear and tear of getting old. Age has caught up with this animal. It's done a lot of gnawing on bones in its lifetime. So there's two different patterns for the detective to look at. One pattern is the um, trauma that was um, visible in number eight's teeth. And here in number 34, we have wear and tear of age. Well, doesn't matter where that wear and tear comes from. Worn tools lead to faulty jobs. They lead to aging in the wolves. So what I'm trying to show you tonight is the other side of a wolf's life. Being a wolf is a very tough job to say the least. Now, um, we talked about remolding. We need to define that a little bit better. Uh, this is number two. And on number two, you see that the upper incisor broken off entirely, just a bit of root. Um, um, and uh, down here, we've got a premolar missing and it's grown in. So that is a little bit of remolding or regrowth. <clears throat> what I wanna do then is take a look at 
483, a female. She was quite a female. Uh, we figured she was probably a geode wolf. Uh, at the time uh, she was collared, she was already an adult. But I, this time we're going to concentrate not just on the tools, but I want to take a look at the toolbox of 483. When we look at 483, the first thing that ought to jump out is this hole in the skull. That hole is a bite wound that went clear into the brain cavity. Now, I can't prove it, but to make this in a more exciting presentation, we're going to say that was the bite of a grizzly. Could have been the bite of another wolf or even a cougar. But yeah, it sounds better if I say it was bitten by a grizzly. Okay, but I want you to look at the bite. There are no sharp edges on here, no broken bones. They're all, they've gone through remolding, regrowth. And so this animal lived a long time after a bite wound went into its brain cavity. Now, also, we've got a couple of abscesses. This is the upper um, premolar four, very important tooth because it matches with the lower M1, and they match like a pair of scissors to slice off meat. Technical term for that's the carnassial pair. But notice there's an abscess at the bottom of that root, and this whole bone here is abscessed off. Well, that's an important tooth because it helps slice the meat to feed. And if it had a side bite on an elk and that elk spun around, that tooth could be popped out and that would be a, to the serious detriment of the wolf. So on 483, we noticed she had injuries from several sources, the abscess and the bite. Now injuries start to heal fairly quickly. A remolding can start in 12 hours. We can't tell you how long that remolding went on, but she lived for a considerable time after she was bit through the skull. Now, perhaps an in infection introduced in that wound was what killed her. Since all we've got is the hard tissue, the bone, and no soft tissue, we can't tell you what caused her death, but we can tell you uh, that she lived for a long time after she was bit. So in that case, the toolbox was badly damaged. Well. Arguably, the most famous wolf in the history of wolf restoration is number 21. Three National Geographic's, Audubon's, Nature, um, movies about him shown on television programs all over the world. And he's the son of the legend number 10. Um, and uh, as I say, arguably the uh, most famous wolf ever in the history of the planet Earth or all around the planet Earth. And in summer of 2004, uh, one of the outfitters on horseback found him dead up under a tree. About a month before that, I had watched him from the footbridge turnout and process of taking down an elk. The elk had rolled over him. Well, with over 200 skulls, around 200 skulls, we've got a great sample size. And now we can start looking at uh, hypotheses. And... Um, testing hypotheses with our samples. So I'm gonna advance a hypothesis that if you're an alpha, be an alpha female, an alpha male, in order to live to an old age, nine, 10 or 11 years of age, you've got to endure more damage to your body, be it disease, be it trauma or whatever. So let's take a look. We know 21 was an alpha male, really famous, very uh, not only picturesque, but recognizable. What does his skull tell us? Well, if we take a look, there's a bone spur up here, which appears to be part of the sagittal crest where muscles attach that's been ripped off, but you see bone growth on it. It hurt, but it didn't really do bad damage. Osteomyelitis, no, not seeing bone infection. This canine looks pretty good, although there is a fracture to the canine there and abscess around it and some incisors are missing. But overall, for a wolf that's up around 10 years of age, this is not bad for an old alpha. So hypothesis disproved. Some alphas do well. Uh, certainly then in the trauma and disease category to a wolf, luck is also an important thing. Now, if you're a bigger wolf, you might help your luck along a little bit by not getting yourself injured in a fight or something. But some alphas do well, they don't show a lot of trauma um, in their lifetime. Well, how about another hypothesis? Wolves exist in packs. 
10 packs get in fights with other packs. And if you're going to get in a fight with another pack, you want your brother or sister in your pack to have your back. You want them to protect you. And therefore, you should have been nice to all your other pack members. So I'm going to advance a hypothesis that pack member interactions are harmless within the pack. That sounds like a good hypothesis. Take care of your brethren so they'll protect you in a fight. Well, let's take a look here. This is 259. And what do we see here? Two holes in the side of the uh, rostrum or the nose area. And sometimes we have holes on the other side. Sometimes it's one hole. Uh, and at first thought, you'd think, oh, well, that's two canine teeth of something puncturing it. But when you look at those holes at the diameter, and when a tooth bites a bone, it never goes in to the full depth. So those would even be from bigger teeth, but two teeth right there that close together. Well, what animal in Yellowstone has two canine teeth that close together? To figure that out, we took and made little clay blocks and we bit them with skulls. Now you think of the perfect skulls, come, or perfect bite is coming straight in, two teeth from the top, two from the bottom. Well, hey, in the fog of battle out there going after an elk, it doesn't work that way, folks. Some bites are sideways and you might get two upper incisors and a lower. You might get one upper, one lower, or even just one or the other there. So we bit these clay box and every combination you can think of, baked them hard, still got them down the museum. And lo and behold, what we found is there's no animal in Yellowstone whose two canine teeth will make a mark like that because it's too big, too close together. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, let's see here. What might that be? Let's take another skull here, kind of hold it sideways. And lo and behold, if you bit across the rostrum, you could leave a hole. If you bit twice, you would leave two holes. Now, if you're a wolf and you go after an elk, the most dangerous place you can be chasing an elk is right behind it because the elk kicks back with great uh, power and can do a lot of damage. So if you're a wolf, your ideal situation is you go out the side around the front and you go for the throat and you bite into the throat. If you're really lucky, your canines go through a juggler vein. However, having necropsied uh, several elk and a lot of deer that were killed by cougars, most of the time that canine doesn't go through the juggler. Uh, veins move a little bit, a tooth hitting it, it might slide sideways or might not hit it. If you happen to hit the juggler vein, that causes major bleeding. Uh, well, that's all the better to help kill the animal. But normally what happens is the wolf hangs onto the throat. They crush the windpipe and they su suffocate the animal to death. I've seen wolves hanging on to good healthy elk for over 10 minutes before the animal finally goes down. So if you're gonna chase an elk and kill it, you go around it, you get to the throat, you bite and hang on. Well, now let's go back to our bite scenario. If you um, get in a fight, would you wanna bite into another wolf and hang on? Well, what happens if you bit into another wolf and hung on, its brother or sister would come bite on you and perhaps kill you while you were hanging on. So the strategy in the fight's got to be different. What you got to do in strategy in the fight is bite and get out, or bite, bite, and get out. And bite, bite would explain two marks in the rostrum. Aha. But some of the wolves that we found with this pattern were in packs where they had never encountered other wolves. So if they've never encountered other wolves from other packs, where do those bite wounds come from across the nose area? Well, then they must come from their own pack members. Therefore, our hypothesis is disproved. And a new hypothesis is pack members do harm each other. I want you to keep that in your minds because we're going to come back to it. Pack members can do harm to each other, perhaps disciplining, perhaps disagreements over food, perhaps disagreements over getting to mate, but pack members do harm each other and it shows up in the bones. Then there's the biggest enemy of the wolf of all. Us, us humans. Uh, most wolf deaths are due to the humans. Uh, that's 
they get hit by cars, they get legally killed by hunting, they get illegally killed, they get poached, they get poisoned. Most of the deaths come from us humans. Now, I'm only going to take a look at one type tonight. I want to look at the fight between a wolf and a car. And when a wolf and a car uh, get in a fight, you know who loses, the wolf. But vehicular trauma leaves a different set of signs on the bones of a wolf. Take a look here. We see a broken canine, but it's broken at the root. And up here, if you look at the edge of these bones, they're sharp. If you're not careful picking up a skull like these, these are sharp enough that they will cut you. Now we know that remodeling or regrowth starts pretty immediately. And if they're that sharp, this means that this was part of a fatal wound. And if we look at the other side, here's another canine broken at the bottom with sharp vehicular trauma around it. Down here, this area is known as a delamination. A bone is somewhat hollow. In the middle, there are uh, cells that are making blood corpuscles and things like that, bone marrow, but it's not solid bone. And if the bone gets broken, uh, part of the bone can stay attached to one side and the other part would be attached to the skin. And then when we clean this skull off, what we get is this little piece here went with this rest of it and it was lost. So this is a delamination. Now you might ask, how do we clean them off? Well, it seems that um, the Wolf Project started picking up skulls back in the beginning. And uh, in fact, they picked up whole skeletons uh, at first, but the public didn't like that. They wanted the wolves to die in place, their bodies and their spirits in essence to go back. But realizing the need for the science and this incredible experiment of wolf restoration was decided to keep collecting the skulls. So there was a large uh, um, stockpile of skulls when Sue and I got involved and we had a permit where we were allowed to go out and pick up wolves and the wolf project started picking up whole wolf carcasses and bringing them back. And we ended up with a stockpile of wolf carcasses and skulls in a walk-in freezer up at Mammoth. Well, then I load them all in my truck. You imagine my pickup truck jammed full of wolf skulls and skeletons and carcasses. And I drove them to Fort Collins in Colorado. Uh, that was an interesting time as I drove through Wyoming thinking what would happen if I got stopped by a highway patrolman with a truck full of dead wolves in an anti-wolf state. But anyway, I got down to Fort Collins and there we had a huge stainless steel pressure cooker. We put in two full wolves and about 10 skulls, uh, close it up and pressure cook it overnight. In the morning, we'd pour out wolf soup, lots of wolf soup, but the bones would be pretty clean. And Diane Carson and Stu Ware would finish cleaning them up, drying them out and numbering them to go into the collections. So that's how we ended up with all these nice, clean skulls here. So back to this wolf, this is trauma, another type of trauma injury. But this time in this trauma, what we see is vehicular trauma with pretty instant death, uh, all sharp edges there, a whole different story. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I want this group of people to be the CSIs. I want you to be the crime scene investigators. And we're gonna take a look at a really famous case. This case caused the proverbial shit to hit the fan, to put it bluntly. It involved 293. She was a petite, nice little female. And she was born up in Swan Lake Flats and lived there into her second year of her life. And then she went missing. Now, when a young wolf leaves a pack, the odds of survival just go down. And so we figured, yep, uh, she's probably passed on. However, Partway in the summer, we get a notice from out in Paradise Valley that she's down there. And she lived a nice life. Uh, she probably ate a few mice, maybe get in, got in on a deer kill, but she didn't prey on livestock of any type and all seemed to be going fine until she went missing from Paradise Valley. And again, we figured, well, lone wolf out there, yep, she's probably uh, passed on. But not all that long later, a phone call comes in from Denver. And uh, we're told that she dispersed to Colorado, but her dispersal had a fatal ending. 
According to the phone call, she was hit by a semi truck on I 90 just to the west of Denver. Well, as I said, shit hit the fan. There was no preparation by the Colorado Division of Wildlife, no rules, no regulations for what would happen if a wolf got into Colorado. Sides were chosen overnight. There were the anti people, anti wolf people that wanted. Any wolf killed the minute one claw came across the border. There were the pro wolf people that didn't want a single hair disturbed on that wolf. There were fights all over. It was in the newspaper. There were ad hoc meetings by the pro wolf, by the anti wolf. There was pressure put on the Colorado Division of Wildlife to do something about this horrible uh, ingression into the state of Colorado. Well, the story was it was hit by a semi trailer on I 70. And one of the very high ups, right at the very top, got on national television, international television for that matter, and said that this wolf, it was witnessed that a semi truck hit it. All right, folks, you're going to be detectives here. I want you to put on your detective cap. I want you to start thinking like a detective. What's the real story here? Well, if you take a look right here, uh, here's the skull. And the skull is now in the Denver Museum of Na Nature and Science. It is 10939 female. You can go down there and look her up if you'd like to. But let's take a look at that skull. And let me ask you a question, folks. Does that skull look damaged? No, it doesn't look damaged. Okay. The zygomatic arch is this thin bone going around here that holds the eye socket and protects the masseteric muscle for eating. And it's a thin bone. Is it broken? No doesn't seem to be broken okay well the mandible that's another word for the lower jaw down there does it look broken well as i studied it looks like it's all together okay the teeth are they broken well those molars premolars canines incisors they all look pretty darn good to me nope they're not broken then okay the palate the palate is the roof of the mouth these two little things here are uh, nares where um, they're natural. They're, that's not a break. You ever take a drink of something and it comes up through your nose? Well, that's kind of where it's happening. But the palate is a very thin bone in the roof of the mouth. Is it broken? No, I'd have to say it's not. Okay. What about the auditory bulla? The auditory bulla contains the uh, three little bones that allow us to hear. And in wolves, compared to bears, this auditory bulla is quite inflated. In a bear, it's flat. One of the ways in the fossil record we can tell uh, bears from wolves, bears from wolf family, bear family from wolf family, is the difference in the auditory bulla. But this is a very thin bone. Is it broken? No, it's not. OK, well, let's take a look at the ribs. Are they damaged? And look carefully. Yes, indeed, there seems to be a roll of damage there. Uh, so yes, they are damaged. And if we look close, do they have pattern? Yes, they do. And when you look at it, they all seem to, the brakes seem to go in one direction. So there's definitely pattern in some broken ribs. Well, let's take a look <clears throat> at the spine. These are the thoracic uh, vertebrae. The ones uh, up in the upper rib cage uh, from the front legs on back. And they ought to be even across the top. But what's this little short guy? And what is this hole almost 100% remolded here? Something happened. And the distance from this to this, why, that's about the width of the canine teeth of a wolf. Okay, now we. Had 293 living up in Swan Lake Flats and abruptly she left. Why did she leave? Well, remember the question of do wolves hurt pack members? And the answer is yes. And that's about the distance across of the canine teeth of the wolf and her pack was not around any other packs. So high probability this damage was done by another wolf, perhaps an adult, that didn't like the competition of a young female for breeding, bit her on the back, picked her up and shook her, perhaps fight over food, but strong possibility that this was done by her pack 
and that caused her to leave Swan Lake Flats and venture down into Paradise Valley. But let's examine more. Take a look at this vertebrae right here. And what you see is this opening between the two halves. Now, when an animal's born, it has what's called a notochord, which is a bundle of nerves that changes over time into your spinal cord. And the bone comes out around it together and fuses together. When it's not fused together, it's known as spina bifida, by for two pieces. When humans get spina bifida, they are in deep trouble. Uh, oftentimes they will be a cripple and wheelchair bound they're alive oftentimes lives are much shorter domestic dogs get spina bifida and they usually have a very short life expectancy now what's going on here is the colorado people are asking us to believe that this petite little wolf from up in paradise valley traveled about 500 miles as the crow flies to i-70 in a short period of time where it got hit by a semi. Hmm, quite an interesting story there. Uh, 293 seems to lack trauma. Uh, um, there is some, but it's not, a, I would argue, it's not the amount of trauma that you'd find if it were hit by a semi truck. In fact, the Colorado Division of Wildlife even said at one point it was hit by two semi trucks. Hmm, there are healed injuries, but those didn't happen at the time it died. The injuries don't seem to match up the story. Okay, let's think about this for a minute and uh, maybe advance a hypothesis or two. All those ribs were broken in a straight line and the straight line seems to show brakes going in one direction. Well, what might that be? That's probably a bullet injury. Okay, if we take that hypothesis, then we say she was shot up in Paradise Valley Whoever shot her picked her up and drove her to Colorado. Okay, uh, but the Colorado Division of Wildlife said that she, um, it was witnessed that she was hit by a truck. In fact, the upper echelon said it was witnessed that she was hit by a truck. So Sue Ware puts on her best go to church Sunday clothing and gets all prettied up and goes in and gets an invest, uh, interview with the head law enforcement officer, Colorado Division of Wildlife. And it was a good interview for a couple hours. And then Sue says, well, I'd like to see the pictures of where she was found. And he kind of hangs his head and looks aside and he says, well, don't know where the pictures are. So Sue says, can I see the file folder of her death? Because this was an endangered species. And he kind of looks down and says, well, I don't know where the file folder is. So Sue comes back. Now, as I said, this is an endangered species. And as an endangered species, the Federal Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement officers would investigate. And it should be sent to the criminal wildlife criminal investigation lab at Ashland, Oregon. So we got on the phone and called Ashland. And Ashland said, um, well, we said to Ashland, uh, what can you tell us about the wolf killed down in Colorado? on I-70 and they said, huh, what wolf? We said the one that was hit by the semi. Uh, what semi? It had never been sent to Ashland. Interesting. So we go to Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement and told them that we were suspicious that this was not hit by a vehicle, it was shot. And uh, we were told we couldn't talk about it. Well, for 18 months, we didn't say a word and then law enforcement came back and said, okay, we've gone as far as we can with this investigation. Uh, we cannot come to a conclusion and you can talk about it now. So that indeed is what we have done. Okay, so let's go a little farther with our hypothesis testing. Our hypothesis espousing, let's say. Um, this wolf we feel was killed in Paradise Valley by somebody with a gun and evidently somebody from Colorado. Now who from Colorado might have a gun in the back of their vehicle and shoot a wolf? Well, could be a hunter, but remember Colorado Division of Wildlife said that this was hit. It was almost a cover up in the story. So perhaps it was somebody in the Division of Wildlife and who in the Division of Wildlife would have a gun in the vehicle? Well, a game warden would. 
hmm, this hypothesis is getting very interesting. So we've got a game warden in our hypothesis who shoots a wolf, drives to Colorado, and as he's getting near Denver with uh, his, quote, prize trophy, he realizes that if this gets out, that this is a career-ending event. He will be fine, he will go to jail, and that will be the end of his career as a wildlife officer. At that point, he panics and throws it out on the road, throws the carcass out on the road, and somebody else notices the carcass and picks it up. Well, folks, that's where our hypotheses stand now. We have never been able to prove them, but we are mighty suspicious that shot in Paradise Valley, driven to Colorado, and dumped on I-70. And the wolves at that point in time had not migrated into Colorado. They got a little help in getting down there. Well, this sort of work involving lots of animals and lots of work takes many, many people. Doug Smith, Dan Steyer, Aaron Staler, and all the wolf projects so all the years deserve thanks. But some hidden people that also deserve a thanks are Colleen Curry and Bridget Guild and their staff from the Heritage Research Center where they archive all the bones. Now, at this point in time, there's no more room for carcasses. Uh, so we're not collecting any more carcasses, but still collecting skulls. Wolf Projects still collecting skulls. And Diane Carson of Flatline Consulting. Remember, we're dedicating this program to Diane tonight. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, it's 10 minutes to eight, pretty good timing here. And what I'm gonna do is throw this open for questions. Questions hey, Jim, or Marianne. <clears throat> gotcha, Marianne. Um, you were showing pictures of the bones from the wolf that supposedly was hit by the semi. If everybody at CWF, Col I mean, the Colorado Division of Wildlife was so secretive, how did anybody get a hold of the bones? Uh, we don't know the answer to that, and we don't know where the skin is either. But the bones did make their way into the Denver Museum as a uh, registered uh, collection, but I uh, cannot tell you how it got there. Okay, but they did end up in the Denver Museum then, and that's how they were analyzed or whatever. Well, we analyzed them, it had nothing to do with the museum. They, are, uh, they have an accession number there. Um, I guess it did have something to do with the museum because Sue works at the museum, but uh, we um, did the analysis separate from the museum. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Comments? Quiet bunch. Uh, quite nice, Jim. Uh, enjoyed it a lot and I hope everybody else did. Thank you very much there, Norm. Uh, and for folks that we were talking about the first generation of the uh, Wolf Watchers, uh, if you don't know him, I'd like to introduce Norm Bishop. Norm was our interface between Park Service, Wolf Restoration, and the public, be they pro or anti-wolf, from well before the uh, introduction to afterwards. And um, Norm, this is said with great uh, admiration, but is one of the grand old men of wolf restoration. And thank you very much for everything that you did. Thank you, Jim. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Hey, Jim, this is a really silly question, but how do you determine a generation of wolf watchers? Oh, if you um, go to our YouTube channel, which is called um, Gathering a Naturalist by chance. And you look at the um, program we did, about a two hour program for the 25th anniversary. On In there, I define it all. Uh, but the first generation were the people that were here at the time the wolves came in and um, knew all of the first generation of wolves. Second generation comes around 
as we had lost all of our first generation of wolves. But if you'll go to that gathering of naturalists, you can see a much more elaborate explanation of that in the introduction. Uh, but you'll find, I think, a lot of fun in just watching uh, the uh, 25th anniversary celebration where we got everybody together we could, including every first generation or we could. Thank you. Being a wolf is tough. Mm -hmm. And the bones tell us things that we don't get, that the observers don't get out there. You know, they may see a wolf kick, they may see some blood on the skin, but the trauma involved with that and the whole story and how much wolves live through and recover is just amazing. And that's what bones tell us. Thank you for joining us for this program. If you like the program, we have a channel on YouTube. Go to YouTube and search for a Gathering of Naturalists. You may also visit our website at tracknature.com where you'll find our books, classes, and other products. Our books are available on amazon.com. Again, thank you for joining us. And this is Jim Halfpenny. Take care my friends. <laughs>